Good afternoon. I think we, um, I suggest we st still wait a little bit uh, until five past or whereabout um, while people are still joining and then start the webinar. Okay, I think we can start. Um, welcome and good afternoon or good morning, wherever you be. Um, my name is Albert Kraler, uh, and I'm pleased to, to welcome you to this edition of the Zooming in on Migration and Asylum webinar series, um, which uh, we have organized this time on the occasion of a recent publication of a special feature on mobility and agents in protected displacement um, in the fourth mi migration review. Um, in this edition of the uh, forced migration review, we will, uh, in this edition of, of, a, of a webinar, we will reflect on traffic findings present, uh, presented in the special feature. But before um, actually presenting this, this, um, this feature and then having a, a panel discussion um, before excellent experts, which I will introduce um, in a minute after, after saying a few words uh, about uh, the special feature that we have prepared uh, as a traffic project um, in the uh, recent forced migration review edition. I would like to, to just um, briefly hand over to Jeff Grisp. Um, who has multiple uh, affiliations and one of them is also that he's an advisor uh, to the forced migration review and can say perhaps a few words about the magazine which is now um, yeah in existence for um, over, almost two decades if i'm not mistaken um jeff if you can uh, just say a few words about the magazine well thank you very much for the invitation and the introduction let me begin by congratulating the traffic team for the great work that they've been doing since the project started, and more particularly for the excellent contribution they have made to the latest edition of the False Migration Review. I had the privilege of reading pre-publication copies of all five articles in the feature on mobility and agency and protracted displacement, and I was impressed by their quality, their originality, and the breadth of the issues and situations that they cover. While a considerable amount has been written about protracted displacement over the past 15 years, these, offer, these articles offer some valuable new insights into the issue, particularly I would suggest in moving away from the somewhat static representation of protracted displacement presented in the earlier literature. And that's an issue that I hope to come back to later in the webinar. As many of you will know, Fourth Migration Review has a number of distinguishing characteristics. It has the widest circulation of any publication in the area of refugees and human displacement. It is published in four languages, English, Arabic, Spanish and French, and it strives to facilitate the exchange of information and ideas between researchers, practitioners, policymakers 
and displaced people themselves. The journal is currently trying to expand and diversify its range of contributors, and I would like to encourage everyone participating in the webinar to become involved with the Forced Migration Review. If you go to the FMR website, which is fmreview.org, you will find a very useful page titled Writing for FMR, which includes a link to a new YouTube video providing further advice to potential authors for the publication. I really would encourage you to get involved with the work of FMR and to contribute to future issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff, for, for this uh, short remarks on, on FMR. Um, and thanks also for the kind words uh, on the work of the uh, traffic project. Um, I will now just say a few words about uh, the overall issue um, that we, where we basically wanted to compile um, a variety, a varied uh, set of, of articles, uh, insights coming from the uh, traffic project. The project itself covers um, much more uh, than that, and we are still uh, in the in the process of finalizing some of the deliverables of the uh, of the project in, in uh, the, the narrower project, uh, and but also working on future um, publications. Um, so we will see a lot more coming out from the traffic projects in, in well, um, actually um, at the moment uh, when you check the website, but also in, in, in the near future. Um, why did we look at, at, at uh, protected displacement? Well, first of all, um, I think we, 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 had the, we felt that um, there is, um, although um, as, as Jeff mentioned, there's a, uh, quite a bit on, on protected displacement, the literature has been of a different, of a specific kind. Uh, has uh, a lot looked also on, um, yeah, on policy contexts, uh, and and uh, and often has has, has pitted uh, protected displacement uh, against um, sort of ordinary displacement as something exceptional, um, something static where people are stuck. Um, where um, the traffic project has felt that um, a little bit too little uh, too little attention has has been paid to, but um, to the dynamics that actually um, 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 protected displacement also um, uh, implies. So uh, one of, of 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 the key um, um, ambitions of of, of uh, our projects and also of this, this mini feature has been to. Uh, look inside uh, protected displacement and um, um, work a little, um, contribute to its reconceptualization uh, re uh, and move away from this um, static um, yeah, uh, conception that has been as, uh, particularly associated with uh, statistical definition um, as, a, as a situation that goes on for five years um, and uh, affects a certain number of, 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 of people, um, um, which has moved a bit the way, uh, the attention away from what um, the, uh, uh, what protectedness actually means in terms of um, inability to access rights, um, exclusion, marginalization, and processes around it. Um, as a flip side of, of uh, um, protected displacement, there is this notion of, of durable solutions or solutions more generally, um, which where we also um, place an, an, um, an emphasis um, very strongly on how individuals themselves, um, sometimes with support of um, policies and agencies supporting them, but also sometimes against um, institutional structures and policies, uh, try to find um, um, yeah, a, a solution to their situation and um, try to rebuild their lives, basically. Um, and that's also pretty much what we try to discuss, this general framework, what, uh, what we try uh, to discuss in, this in the first article of this uh, mini feature, which focuses on this, um, yeah, uh, on this uh, um, conceptual issues. Um, and where we also place a, a strong emphasis on the role of mobility um, 
in situations of um, protected displacement, both as a sort of a, uh, of a solution, but also sometimes as a condition uh, one is forced into. Um, and, and, and other articles in this mini feature uh, address that, uh, that aspect more. Um, I think um, I, I stop here with, um, with describing the, um, the overall conceptual uh, framework um, and would invite um, Marcus uh, to say a few words about the first uh, article. And I also in a second show um, the table of contents. Yeah, should I go ahead? Yes, please. Yes, so we see the table of contents. And as you see, we had the uh, uh, honor to be the second <laughs> after this valuable input on the theory. And uh, before I start talking about the content, I would like to thank everybody who participated in this. I mean, we are as well very grateful to be given this chance to publish here. And um, we are grateful to all the other authors, but I wanted to especially mention all the assistants and co-workers that we were having that made it possible, and this goes particularly out to those in um, Ethiopia and Congo who helped us and who can't uh, be with us. And I think this is important as well now because what we have described uh, is uh, something that is framed uh, within a larger context, and this context as we see now very clearly in Ethiopia, but as well in Congo, for everybody who follows the news there, is a political one. So I think it's very uh, important that when we talked about durable solutions, we talked about the durable solutions within the framework of UNHCR, but the real solution is a political solution to conflicts that should precede this. But what we uh, tried to show is that uh, the classic uh, durable solutions, which are most of the time rather normative than descriptive, are uh, having an impact on the everyday life of the people that uh, have to uh, cope with the uh, different kind of administrative and legal and everyday um, obstacles and challenges that these policies result in. And what we, um, to be very brief and just uh, hopefully um, tempt you to read the whole article summarize is that we uh, propose four different uh, models which is uh, long distance or onward oriented mobility then the medium to short distance locally oriented mobility thirdly the backward oriented mobility which means that this is uh, the reference to what is usually called return and reintegration but fourthly as well uh, wanted to make a reference to immobility which is uh, uh, not only is a case for people being uh, held up in the frontier between Belarus and Poland, but as well very often those who are in uh, the camps. And we have uh, had very nice uh, interview partners who as well thankfully opened uh, up to us, who show that all kind of uh, restrictions and legal obstacles to move mobility have not really been helpful. And that uh, especially in um, Ethiopia, where where they have changed from a strict encampment policy to an open uh, policy, out of camp policy, they have had uh, much uh, better options. And that's why we vote uh, or we would suggest to have better tailor made and need based uh, solutions and uh, base these solutions on what is actually happening on the ground. And that's, I think, my 60 seconds. <laughs> Thanks. Your audio. Thank you, Marcus. Um, well, I immediately hand over to, to Sarah for briefly saying a few words about um, the article on, on Jordan. Thank you, Albert. Thank you all for joining us today. Thanks to the, uh, the panelists for commenting. Jeff, it's always lovely to see you. So thanks again to everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Tobin. We co-authored a piece with uh, Fawaz Momini, Tamara Adelil Yakub, and Rola Feris al Massad uh, in the case of Syrian refugees in Jordan. And in short, uh, you know, I think the notion of protracted displacement often brings to mind the idea that people are sitting stuck in conditions of displacement and are passive victims without agency. And I think a lot of uh, has been written, um, a lot of good literature and not as good literature has been written in recent years about this notion, um, trying to sort of push back or consider the 
idea of agency and we unpack it a bit by exploring mobility aspirations versus mobility intentions. Um, in the case of Syrians in Jordan, finding that very few have mobility intentions, but nearly all have mobility elaborated mobility aspirations. And these mobility aspirations are about imagining new futures in family reunification with family networks um, and in places and spaces in which people are safe and healthy um, and able to live a life in dignity. And so uh, this is our sort of contribution to the notion of um, agency in protracted displacement, um, that the ways in which Syrians are imagining their futures is a representation of the kinds of agency and expressions of it that can be had um, in protracted displacement. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. Um, Eva, you are going to say a few words about um, your yes. joint article with the Italian team. Uh, thank you, Albert. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Uh, I'm Eva Papadzani from Aristotle University of Thessaloniki and the Greek team of uh, uh, Traffic Project. Uh, we co-authored our paper with uh, Panos Hadziprokopi, also from uh, the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece and uh, Ferruccio Pastore and Emanuela Roman from Fieri, uh, uh, our uh, partners uh, from Italy. Uh, in our article, we use the cases of uh, Greece and Italy uh, that we think that share at least three common structural features uh, in order to argue that people living in protected displacement experience what we call constrained mobility at different scales, uh, from local to transnational. Uh, we first examined the immobilizing effects of uh, European and national regulations as regards both intra-European immobilization for asylum seekers and protection beneficiaries and international immobilization for asylum seekers in both countries uh, with a special focus uh, in Greece where the hotspot approach has become a key mechanism of migration control along with uh, other mechanisms deriving from the recently established uh, reception system. We also explore different aspects of uh, constrained mobility as a survival strategy of people uh, in order to navigate the complex asylum systems in order to reunite with their networks or in order to meet their basic needs. We are doing so both as regards international and intra-European movements, some of which may result in what we call a uh, mobility trap and mobility paradox by which uh, irregularity seems to allow mobility, whereas uh, legality actually prevents it in some cases. Uh, we also highlight some additional immobilizing effects of uh, COVID-19, and we stress the need of policies taking into account the important role of constrained mobility, uh, the important load it has in shaping everyday lives and prospects of people in protected displacement in both countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eva. Um, and now over to Ben. Yeah, hello, everybody. Yeah, so in the uh, introduction, um, Albert, Nuno, and I wrote that mobility has always been an important element in the solutions available to address protracted displacement. And this notion sort of that mobility is beneficial uh, can clearly be um, confirmed based on our traffic research in Germany, um, which we, which Simone Christ, my colleague at BIC, uh, led and which I participated and several other colleagues and students. Um, in our interviews about with around 70 um, refugees from, from Syria, Afghanistan and Eritrea, um, yeah, we saw how people made use of their social networks to flee their countries, to make their ways towards Europe and to find protection and a, and a way to the future here in Germany. And um, we also noted a few stories. I mean, sort of we had the let's say, I mean, sad and typical stories about the irregular journeys to Europe, but we also saw that people made use of other programs and particularly one program that was um, invented at that time, um, humanitarian admission scheme by the German government and the German federal states that was implemented in uh, 2013. And between 2013 and 2017, around 44,000 Syrian refugees came to Germany um, based on this program and based on the network ties that they had because it was based on the premises sort of that um, people could sort of um, 
yeah, bring in their relatives and then they guarantee, have to sign a guarantee for their, their relatives and pay for the first part, first two years um, of, their, of their time in Germany. So overall, through this project, you could see, okay, how, um, yeah, it can, can, can be seen as a complementary pathway, additional tool, you know, how protection can be provided and that includes both the notions of mobility and networks, but there are also downsides to such a program. I just want to name um, five very briefly. Um, so it was a humanitarian solution, but the problem was at that time that this program was only temporary. So it, it ended with sort of the long summer of migration when, uh, when 1.2 million people came to Europe was not prolonged then. Um, it was also transformed um, with the EU-Turkey deal and it was then not taken up again. Um, second, the program was limited to Syrian nationals. Um, so it has was not extended to other groups, um, other pe people who find themselves in a protracted situation such as Afghans, Iraqis or Somalis or Eritreans or so. Um, even though these groups might also have um, networks, transnational contacts to Germany. Third, there's a social economic bias in this program because it somehow privileged those who had um, networks and those who had yeah, relatives who were in a comparatively good um, social economic position and could thus then afford to pay for the, the, the guarantees in a sense, so that they are very credible in a sense, and others were excluded. Um, the fourth aspect. Um, you also can see these private sponsorship programs and community sponsorship programs that were part of that as a, yeah, that there is a certainly a risk that sort of the obligation um, of the state to provide protection and also to pay for this protection and the arrival of people is circumvented um, and the risks and the costs are somehow outsourced um, to, to private persons and families. And the fifth and last point um, is sort of that at that time, so there was a multiplicity of actors and programs by the federal states and the German state as such, which created a lot of confusion at that time, and which um, more importantly also led to very different rights and, and duties of the people who came through this humanitarian admission program. Um, nonetheless, it showed also that um, yeah, people can often build on their networks and that um, states can develop programs or so that um, and allow for mobility um, and to find protection that yeah, along the lines of networks. And um, if you look at the, the, the recent um, Koalitionsvertrag, the agreement of the new German government, you will also note that uh, such a humanitarian admission program is currently being planned for um, Afghans families as well. Uh, um, thank you very much, um, Benjamin. Um, it took a little bit longer um, than than planned for presenting this issue, but I'm, I'm, I'm I find uh, yeah I've, I found it useful to to have a little bit of, of a deeper insight, and I would uh, recommend to everybody that just to take a brief look. The articles are very short and accessible, so four pages at most, um, and you will find uh, find it on online on the uh, addresses that, that Gizem uh, indicated in the chat. Um, I would like now to move to the second part of this uh, and the major part, the main point of this webinar, namely the panel discussion with, uh, with, uh, with our panelists and uh, briefly introduce uh, each one. Well, we have already heard uh, Jeff uh, Crisp. Um, he has been uh, head of, of, of policy and evaluation at UNHCR um, and worked in various other functions since and uh, is also affiliated to the Refugee Studies Center in Oxford. Um, and um, also one of our uh, traffic advisory board members. Um, Megan Bradley is an associate professor at McGill University in Canada um, and has published widely on displacement, also with a certain focus on internal displacement and um, uh, policies around um, um, displacement. Her, one of her, um, yeah, her most recent book uh, in, uh, is about the International Organization for Migration, about which she also has written critically regarding uh, that organization's role uh, in the context of displacement, um, but she's also looked at, at um, dual resolutions in the context of Colombia, if I'm not mistaken. 
Um, Orup El, El Abed uh, is a senior researcher based in Jordan, working for the, um, um, for the Center for uh, Lebanese Studies, but also affiliated with the LEARN uh, network, for, um, um, to which also Jeff and Megan are uh, sort of affiliated, uh, an initiative um, coordinated um, in, in, uh, by James Milner um, at um, um, Carlton University uh, called uh, Local uh, Engagement and Refugee Research Network. Um, yeah, uh, and um, Orup has, has focused in, in her work, uh, especially on vulnerable refugee groups in the Middle East, um, including uh, also people in protected displacement. Last but not least, um, I welcome uh, Caroline Jacobs, um, also from the Traffic uh, Consortium, um, who uh, is an assistant professor at Leiden University and has uh, in her research um, worked a lot on, on issues around displacement, um, internal displacement in the Congo, focusing in particular on urban refugees, on urban internally displaced um, people. Um, yeah, welcome again, and thank you for, for, for joining um, this, this panel. In my first uh, set of questions, I would actually go back to the very notion of, of um, protected displacement and the sort of um, yeah, uh, associated notion of, of solutions. When we, when, we, uh, uh, we, when we term was coined, and um, Jeff, you have been one of those uh, behind that, that very concept, um, the idea was to kickstart again um, the debate on, on, on durable solutions and, and shed light that there is a large uh, part of the refugee, of the global uh, refugee population that doesn't find um, a durable solution and that this needs urgent attention. So it was very solution oriented. Um, and um, the, 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 the notion, uh, a way to shed, to, to basically point to a problem that can, uh, can be resolved. Um, yeah, and, and I just um, would like to, to uh, starting with you, Jeff, um, ask you to reflect on what 20 years on or almost 20 years on, what, what this notion and this idea to, uh, yeah, to, to focus again on, on solution, what does this, um, what, what, what traction does it still have? Uh, in a context where, especially among Western governments, uh, the support for uh, asylum systems is, is at the moment uh, waning and very limited. Um, and protection is very often associated with basically um, yeah, um, um, protection from physical harm. And um, um, yeah, and, and, and uh, solutions, longer term solutions um, are not really the focus anymore. So, uh, what 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 are your reflections yeah, thank you very much. on that? Yeah, I mean, I think to answer this question, it might be useful to recall the origins of the notion of protracted displacement, which I would think that you've already suggested from around the, the year two thousand. In other words, about twenty years ago. I think it's worth remembering that during the previous decade, in other words, the nineteen nineties, UNHCR and other members of the international community have been very preoccupied by situations where people were on the move. First, we had major new emergencies and refugee movements in places such as the Balkans and the Great Lakes region of Africa. Secondly, we had a number of mass repatriation movements, for example, in Central America, Southeast Asia and Southern Africa. And thirdly, a growing movement of asylum seekers from the global south to countries in the global north. And it was only really in around 2000 that we began to realize that while many refugees were on the move. There were also many refugees who were not moving at all, but were found themselves stuck in protracted refugee situations and also found that often it was very difficult for them to move because they were confined to camps and often penalized if they tried to exercise any kind of freedom of movement. And I think the problem with that framing that we that we undertook in, in around 2000 and onwards was it tended to present protracted refugee situations as essentially static, whereas 
more recently, we've begun to realize that even long established refugee camps, such as Kakuma and Dadaab in Kenya, for example, are actually very dynamic entities in the sense that some refugees have left the camps and made their way to urban areas. Some have moved on to other countries, or well, new refugees have arrived from countries such as Somalia and South Sudan. And of course, like any other community, deaths and births have led to constant changes in the demography and the social dynamics of such camps. So my argument would be that protracted displacement remains a very useful concept, as long as it recognizes the mobility and dynamism that traffic research has highlighted. As far as solutions are concerned, I would argue that we also have to use that concept advisedly and carefully, as what we describe as solutions appear to be increasingly elusive and increasingly fragile. Many refugees are repatriating these days, not on a voluntary basis, but under duress and live a very precarious, precarious life once they've returned to their country of origin. A second solution of local integration has really almost disappeared from the refugee policy agenda and has been replaced by the much more nebulous and I would suggest misleading UNHCR notion of what they describe as local solutions. We may want to come back to that concept later. And then finally, while there has been a long-standing tendency to assume that resettled refugees have found a durable solution as soon as they step off the plane in the country that's admitted them, it is now time, I think, to move beyond the usual fixation with resettlement numbers and to focus more seriously on the quality of resettlement outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff, for, for, for these insights. Um, I would like to, to, to ha hand over to, to, to Megan and uh, ask you um, about the, yeah, basically also a little bit of the same question, but also adding on, on, on this from um, my own impression, uh, impression was that, you know, in, 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 in the context of international uh, displacement, uh, re the refugee realm, so to say, protected displacement has been broadly used mostly in the term in the in this statistical term that uh, UNHCR uh, defined it um, um, almost 20 years ago so looking at long standing um, yeah refugee situations but but um, there's not been that many efforts in looking actually at the quality uh, of protection um, in, in in displacement and also what you know, the, the, the different um, rights um, that are uh, that are associated with it, and what, what struck me uh, is that um, my impression from the literature, from the legal and policy literature on internal displacement, is that this it is this field where this has uh, moved much further, uh, further, where you know uh, where, where there is this uh, um, interagency standing for, um, framework. Um, a framework on, on internal displacement, which has a number of, of, broadly speaking, indicators of what actually a quality solution uh, would mean and what what um, yeah what protection means in a in a in a, in a material sense, um, which um, which I have not seen in the same way uh, in the literature on on international. Um, migration so that that leaves me a little bit um, with the same question as uh, that that uh, Jeff ended uh, has there been um, a fixation in the in the literature on in international displacement uh, displacement across borders on you know, uh, formal statuses and um, yeah just someone being recognized as and when the, the story ends mm -hmm. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much, Albert, for the questions and uh, for the opportunity to be here. Um, congratulations to everyone who's been involved with this project. I think the results are fascinating and important, and I'm glad that you're convening this kind of public conversation around them. Uh, one of the 
aspects of your project that I particularly appreciated, and I'm glad you um, uh, you opened up this issue in your comments and questions just now, Albert, is the way in which um, the traffic project has looked to try to connect issues around refugee uh, displacement and experiences of protracted displacement uh, on the one hand, and then questions of internal displacement on the other. And I see Beth Ferris uh, is one of the participants uh, today, and she, of course, has done a lot of work, and, and we've uh, spent some time collaborating on these issues in the past. So um, maybe she can also chime in uh, when we open it up for broader conversation. You know, I think we often tend to talk about uh, protracted refugee situations and other forms of protracted displacement as if these are sort of separate categories. But of course, once we start looking at these experiences, uh, not as static conditions, but as dynamic, we see the ways in which these are connected on a whole range of levels. I mean, many people who experience protracted refugee situations have been in a protracted internal displacement situation before they cross an international border. We see ways in which family connections, uh, community connections uh, continue to persist in contexts of protracted refugee situations. So uh, thinking about mobility across borders and connections transnationally across borders. These are often very um, entangled populations. Um, as your team has pointed out, we don't really have um, as much data on uh, dynamics around protracted internal displacement. Uh, but again, as your project has pointed out, there are limitations, I think, to focusing uh, too much on statistical approaches to understanding uh, conditions of protracted displacement. Um, so all this to say, I do think that it's really important to be taking a more holistic and integrated uh, approach to these issues. And in some ways, we do have uh, some significant frameworks in relation to internal displacement to think about uh, what solutions might mean. So Albert referenced um, the Interagency Standing Committee ISC framework on durable solutions for IDPs. And this presents a particular notion of what a solution might look like. So in this case, solutions are framed uh, as having been achieved when people who are internally displaced don't have specific challenges, protection concerns that are related to displacement uh, and that might distinguish them from the conditions that are faced by their neighbors. So this is an interesting way to think about what a solution might mean. It's hard to operationalize. I think that that's one thing it's important to be clear about. Um, and we can contrast it to how UNHCR has typically conceived of solutions for refugees. And this is, of course, really focusing on the reconstruction of an effective citizenship relationship, right? Either you can go back to your home country uh, and be reaccepted and integrated as a citizen there, or you can be recognized as a citizen in a host country or in the context of resettlement. And we, of course, know that these kinds of formal uh, legal opportunities are very limited. And I appreciate the, the focus that your team has brought to questions of mobility as a sort of way of trying to uh, escape from the strictures of these uh, normative and legalistic approaches. So I think that this is critical, but I think like Jeff, I also have some questions or concerns about that approach. We see um, this total profusion of a certain kinds of discourse around solutions. So if you look at the Global Compact on Refugees, for example, so many different things are presented as a solution. I mean, an app is a solution. Uh, a new kind of processing of paperwork is a solution. Resettlement is a solution. So I suppose my question to throw it out to the group is, when we're thinking about mobility and how it relates to solving protracted refugee situations and protracted internal displacement situations for that matter as well, what is the bar for something to be uh, considered as a solution? Uh, what's the bar normatively, legally, uh, in terms of how people understand the, the challenges that they face in their own daily lives? I think we can as researchers uh, respect and understand that there are important ways in which displaced populations identify for themselves certain coping strategies and mobility can be really key in this respect. But is a coping strategy the same thing as a solution? I think it depends on who we're asking and how we define the problem. But at the level of the sort of policies and practice of the refugee regime, I have to admit that I do have some qualms about um, this sort of move to recast almost anything as a solution. I think if we look at the experiences of a lot of uh, refugees and IDPs for that matter, who are um, 
um, turning to mobility as a way to deal with the challenges that they encounter in protracted displacement, it's really important not to romanticize what that experience looks like. Uh, you know, certainly in North America, what mobility as a solution looks like often means um, working with no documentation, living under constant threat of deportation, of separation from one's children. And these are dynamics that we see in other regions of the world as well. Um, so on the one hand, of course, we need to recognize that this is an important part of a coping strategy uh, and respect it as such. But I do have concerns about um, suggesting that this might be a solution uh, without recognizing the important toll that it often um, puts on people who are who are trying to make a go of it through these kinds of uh, strategies. So thank you very much uh, for the chance to share some initial opening comments, and I'll look forward to the continued conversation. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Megan, also for these critical comments on, on what the role of mobility could be. And in, indeed, I think there's, there's generally a, a bit of confusion about uh, the debate on, on solutions where um, we also the traditional solutions, um, a return, uh, local integration and resettlement uh, have been misunderstood as the solution in itself. Uh, and, and probably it's more useful uh, to think of these as possible pathways to, to a solution. Uh, and mobility is, is probably, um, it should be, be, be understood in, in, a, in a similar way. It can be for some people, it can, and also as a pol policy tool. Um, it can, uh, there is a potential of using it um, for a solution, but it's it's not uh, aggressive and, and in itself, uh, definitely not. Um, or I would like now to uh, uh, invite you to uh, reflect on, uh, protected displacement in a in a situation where you know, which is which has been in a in a sense the standard or the prime example of of uh, of uh, protected displacement with Palestinians of course being that that group uh, that un never uh, resolvable um, uh, refugee problem as as one would have raised it a, a few decades ago um, so, uh, and, and at the same time, um, the debate on protected displacement um, has not been, has not actually looked at, um, at Palestinians too much, uh, and um, uh, which is in itself also uh, in interesting, even though there is, there's, 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 of course, reasons to it, not that, that, that uh, the Geneva Convention was not meant for, to include Palestinians and so on. Um, and in the meantime, there is, you know, where, where, where been, the Middle East has been um, yeah, affected by um, a series of other uh, subsequent refugee crises uh, in Iraq, uh, Syria, mm -hmm. um, now in Yemen, um, and, um, and um, a, a particular challenge here, I think, is the, the sort of the, the, the special status also of, of um, the Middle East as mostly non-signatory uh, states. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to be part of this discussion and congrats uh, by all means to the team of traffic uh, for the work they have done and for the analysis presented uh, in the five articles with a very uh, fresh perspective uh, to, the, to, uh, to the understanding of, uh, of protracted displacements. Thanks to Sarah and her team also for the article uh, written on Jordan, with a way uh, looking at the, at the agency and uh, the agency versus imagination in light of the reality, the grim reality of being stuck. Uh, well, protracted, I would say uh, in the Middle East, I would see protracted displacement is associated uh, with several issues. Uh, that could, in, in a way, enable us to unpack the depiction of the of the word stuck. I see that even Sarah in, in the article very much emphasized on it. On one hand, the first point I'd like to address is the legal uh, lengthy and limbo status that is nurtured by the host state's domestic laws and policies, on one hand, and by the international protection under the 1951 uh, convention that has proven to be, in a way, failing. In Jordan, and in 
fact, a good example as well is in Lebanon as well, uh, that are two countries uh, that are not signatory of the 1951 convention, the legal status of the refugees have been very much affected by politics, but also by funding that's being thrown in from the international community. These two matters in the very much affect the categorization, the labeling that's being given to the refugees. You very much alluded to the fact that Palestinians, for example, are into protracted refugee status. But again, when, when we're talking about refugee, Palestinian refugees, whom are we talking about? Are we talking about those who came in 1948, who are, for example, in a country like Jordan, are citizens? Are we talking about those who came in 1967, where about a million of them continue to be in a very in limbo status? So here we come to something that Sarah did allude to in her article with the labeling and the categorization that very much shapes the rights for these refugees and what they can really access. In both Jordan and Lebanon that are not signatory of the 1951 convention, yet they are both signatory of what is called the Memorandum of Understanding with UNHCR, where both countries are not expected to serve refugees from their own budgets, yet they are expected to support the UNHCR mission in serving the refugees and enabling the funding from the international community to secure the well-being for the refugees until solutions are found. Now, the road to the Syrian response plan was shaped, speaking of the, the, the influx, the mass influx that came to Jordan. We're talking about one million and a half and one million and a half in Jordan, same number almost uh, arrived in Lebanon. This very much uh, pushed the international community to invite these two countries to be part of the Syrian response plan since 2014, in, sure, in, in order to ensure the systematic call for support from the international community to ensure the support for the host countries. More specifically, the response plan under the umbrella very much focused on the resilience of these countries in order to ensure funds that could feed in the development of these countries that would ensure the well-being of the citizens and the refugees. Now, in 2016, uh, we had something called the London Donors Conference, where there was the way where suddenly we very much labeled the Syrians from being guests, exactly as Sarah is referring to, to very much deciding that these refugees, very much talking about the Balkan story, these refugees will, be, will stay in the region for almost 17 years. So here we are talking about a new label, a new categorization that was put for the Syrian refugees, where they have become into temporary protection, falling under the temporary protection, expecting them at one point to go back home. This can be called temporary protection, where rights were secured under education, under health, uh, right to catch up with education as well under the informal sector and uh, inf informal sector uh, with the funding that was put under that. And work, here we come to something that's very important, work was also uh, was supported under something called, particularly in Jordan, something called the Jordan Compact, where refugees were very much invited to join in sectors that are not inviting professionals, but they are inviting people to be part in, in the agricultural sector, construction se sector and services, which very much, here we are talking about mobility, but it's very much limiting the social mobility. So I would like uh, here to raise a point when we are talking about mobility, the physical mobility. I am here addressing the legal element because with the legal element, we are very much also to address the social and the professional mobility that has been also stuck. Now, while Jordan addressed in the Jordan response plan and the Jordan compact the situation of the Syrians, ex-Gaza Palestinian refugees who arrived in Jordan since 1967 continue until today, and they are almost today exceeding uh, 600,000 as per the census of 2015, they continue to be in an in limbo status with very limited rights that have been almost jeopardized by other refugees. You, you drew uh, uh, our attention to the, to the uh, mass exile, a uh, mass influx of Iraqis that came to Jordan uh, since uh, the early 2000, uh, 2003. As a result of the Iraqis who arrived in Jordan and with the call of the international community that was very much, uh, that came along to support that, uh, that influx, 
uh, the Palestinian refugees had to pay the price where education was funded for Iraqis. And suddenly they said, since Palestinians are unable to pay for their education, they should not really go to public sector education. So it, a rate of education was imposed on Gaza Palestinian refugees. And that was very much affected as well for ex-Palestinian uh, Gazans in Jordan with the Syrian story, where at one point they had the right to work in the private sector. And as a result of the Jordan Compact, they paid the price where they were very much prevented in working in the public sector in general, and the, pardon me, in the private sector in general, and they were just limited to work under the three sectors that were open, agriculture, construction, and services. So in a nutshell, what's happening is that protect, protracted refugee status is very much associated with this limitation of solutions. On one hand, we're talking here about a country that's not a signatory of the 1951 convention. Therefore, the local integration has never been an option for Jordan nor for Lebanon. So, and this has not been at all welcomed. The repatriation, again, for this Palestinian story with the Zionist situation that continues in the occupation of, uh, of historical Palestine continues to be up up, up in the sky, where no rights are given for these Palestinians on their host countries, nor a right for them to, re, to be repatriated to their homeland. With the Syrian story, the situation does not seem to be really reassuring since the conflict is, is persisting. And here we come to the resettlement. The resettlement with the very much continuous externalization uh, of uh, uh, policies against uh, people from the global south, starting from Barcelona 1995 and continuing with Dublin 1 and Dublin 2, uh, Dublin 2001 and 2002. This, th this tells us how this issue is continuing to very much creating or emphasizing the regional blockage against the refugees from entering either Europe or the Americas. The idealized one big world, and really I'm going to finish with a positive note with the grim reality, uh, based on the idealized one big world that has been depicted in the article uh, through technology and smartphones in the article of Syria on Jordan, and the idealized lifestyle uh, of the well-funded refugees. Uh, and I want here to stop for a second to tell you how often the refugees are seeing the fact that they are when, come to, when they come to Germany or when they to go to America or to Europe, they are getting this kind of housing subsidy and money subsidy. They believe that this is the only status when they are refugees. I call it very much the commodification of refugee status that is very much being sub subsidized when they are in the global north and they are not subsidized when they are continue to be in the global south. So in a, in a positive note, and I want to finish with this concept of, uh, of uh, the, social, uh, the social network. Well, the, the nice element in this article that we read on Jordan was how the social network and the social capital, and I'm going to quote uh, the, the article saying that uh, the, the, it enables the actor to contract and to expand their networks. So in a way, this localized, today, one of the solutions that is being presented to us is the localized humanitarian aid, the localized services of the refugee community that seem to be one of the positive realities engendered amongst the refugees in the host countries. I am today working on a, on a research that's very much studying the refugee-led initiatives and refugee-led uh, organizations that are being formed despite the fact that states not, are not often welcoming this in order for this community to support itself. So the mobility, coming back to, uh, to Sarah's article, indeed the physical mobility is not existing and it is existing through the imagination, yet there is this very much normative solution that we're able to see on the ground through this kind of activism uh, that is being that is really existing happening in a very subtle way on the ground in a country like Jordan in a country like Lebanon uh, where these people are grouping themselves trying to create their own communities to challenge this kind of uh, stagnant reality I try to address the Palestinian issue while the Syrian issue and the Iraqi issue while looking positively at the element, the positive element of social networks.
Well, thank you very much, uh, Oro, for this very encompassing, uh, comprehensive uh, response, and also pointing at at, at both um, uh, the agency of of uh, refugees themselves and the potential that is there. Again, I think we need to to look at and discuss also what it does does whether this or already present a, a solution in a um, and perhaps it does in an in a in a sort of hostile environment, uh, international and uh, often also domestically hostile environment where this is that this is something that uh, a potential uh, that can be tapped uh, and should be should be supported. Um, um, while not, not not ignoring perhaps also far reaching solutions on the policy levels on different policy levels, including on the on the international ones, and also I, I think also thank you for for pointing at the the, the hierarchies uh, of rights that um, different categories of of, of displaced uh, persons are subject to. Um, you 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 pointed at those in the Middle East. Uh, uh, we encountered that also a lot in in our research on on on, on Europe. Um, ever pointed to to that. Uh, so I think that's that's also uh, needs needs um, yeah needs to be um, of attention. I'm, I just um, I also want to to invite the audience if you want to pose a question already now, please feel free to do so. Um, we might be able to pick it up. Um, and uh, I would like to to invite Carolyn now to reflect on um, on uh, the notion of protected displacement on how useful it is um, in the current context. Um, Caroline. Yes, thanks, Albert. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, I think we've made a nice shift when thinking about protected displacement from this more quantified statistical definition to a definition where we say, well, it's about it's more a social condition of insecurity, of physical, of human insecurity, of livelihood insecurity. Uh, I nevertheless still catch myself, and I think many of us do so, that despite all our efforts to move away from these numbers, that still in defending the relevance of our research, in selling our articles, we still resort to these numbers. And I feel uncomfortable about it. Uh, especially in relation to IDPs where there is no formal registration of IDPs and where the numbers actually don't necessarily tell as much. Uh, I think we still almost mechanically type this paragraph in our articles uh, on the numbers of displacement. And it's something that I feel actually a bit bad about because I don't think it's very helpful, um, but it is somehow needed to communicate our message to show the relevance to the world uh, that is still asking for these sort of hard indicators. Whereas I think throughout our research, we show that we actually have a story to tell in terms of individual experiences, in terms of way in which people uh, move out of protectedness if they do. Uh, and I think it's not so much about counting these numbers. In a way, it's good that we are not having this limited definition anymore. But I think we still should be very much aware that we are still using it in a hidden way. So that's my sort of my own doubt about the way in which I, I use the concept in itself. And I think we all do. I also think it's good that we are moving to a more dynamic uh, approach and more dynamic definition. But I see I'm still critical a little bit about the way we use it, because I think in general, we still tend to talk about how people move out of protectedness in a sort of progressive, evolving way, uh, whereas, which suggests a sort of linear process, right? It's moving from being stuck to not being stuck, whereas in reality, people muddle through. They move on, they improve their lives, but then they also repeatedly fall back into more precarity and more vulnerability, get on their feet again, rise, then they fall back again. And it's reality is not as neat and straightforward as moving out of protectedness seems to suggest. And I think this is to a large extent related to the fact that many displaced people are not fully in control of what possibilities they are able to, to draw on, to access uh, to in rebuilding their lives 
and this, I guess, relates very much to what uh, Oop was just mentioning, the social network, which is also one of the pillars of our research that we look into the, the connectivity uh, of people. So upon arrival in their place of refuge, many people, of course, they depend on, on close relatives or not so close relatives, on aid agencies to, to find housing, to find a job, uh, to cover the hospital bills, to basically to rebuild their lives. But these connections, I think, and we describe it in our working paper as a chain of connectivity that people need. So they build up their networks gradually, they get more access. But this, this chain of connectivity can get very easily disrupted. And that's the moment when people fall back again, when they, they're not in this linear process anymore, uh, but on the bumpy road towards a solution. And I guess that's what I would like to to point out that we should keep this in mind as well. Even if we take a dynamic, a more dynamic perspective, we should still consider that it's it's not a linear uh, dynamic in that sense. And I will get more to the mobility element that Megan was raising in the, the second round because I guess that's more related to the, the second question. Yeah. So that's, yeah, these are two main uh, points that I would like to make about protected displacement as a concept. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, um, Carolina. I think it's it's a good point that uh, the, well, all all policy debates about solutions are very very much follow very much a linear kind of uh, approach in imagining that you know it, it's it's a it's a story of progress, or at least we should people uh, should put people on a on a on a track of of uh, achieving progress, not um, considering very often the, the also the, the the, the ups and downs uh, of um, people's lives and also changing local local circumstances. I think, when, uh, yeah, uh, Congo is a, a very good example of, of, of a very uh, volatile situation um, where, uh, yeah, violence, uh, patterns of violence change very quickly. Um, but also, you know, yeah, Afghanistan has, has been a, uh, is, is a showcase example and, and Syria as well you know, of, of situations that that change from one year uh, uh, to another, or even from 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 one day to another, very quickly, uh, and then of course also uh, change for circumstances entirely uh, under which people people live. Um, I would like now to 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 move to to the to the second round of of questions. Um, the discussion where we um, focus more more. Um, yeah, uh, more narrowly on the on on the traffic results in terms of, of what, in your view, what would be the key takeaways and also the key, um, yeah, problem problems perhaps also with with some of the, the uh, traffic findings. Uh, Megan already alluded to some of the, you know, open questions uh, around the uh, mobility, for example, to what extent it can be. Um, be uh, a pathway towards towards uh, a solution, and probably one can can raise similar questions about networks um, as well. Um, and um, yeah, I would like to to uh, give the floor first to to Jeff, and we follow the the usual order. Yeah, thanks very much, Albert. Um, yeah, I'm going to come back to a point that was made a few minutes ago by Orub. Actually, um, I mean, I think my principal takeaway from the research that you've done and it, it's not a particularly new or innovative idea, is that we need to move away from kind of top-down approaches to solutions and develop a much better understanding of uh, the way in which refugees and displaced people perceive their own predicament, the way they plan for the future, and the way in which they take active steps to resolve their own plight, using whatever resources, capacities, and assets are at their disposal, including, of course, a traffic points out social networks. And I think one question that this raises is whether and how large international humanitarian organizations such as UNHCR can really develop that kind of bottom down or bottom up understanding um, and then amend their policies and their programs accordingly. Now, of course, as Orib just said, the recent growth and visibility of so-called refugee led organization provides a potential means whereby the perspectives and aspirations of refugees and displaced people can be taken much more seriously by the major international 
humanitarian agencies. But the question I'm asking myself here is how easy will it be for these big organizations to move in that direction? And I was very much thinking about this yesterday. I was reading a new article yesterday about uh, refugees in Ethiopia, which made the point that refugee-led organizations tend to be informal, highly decentralized, networked and transnational, fluid and under bureaucratized. Those were the adjectives used by that article to describe refugee-led organizations. At the same time, the article points out that UNHCR and the big international NGOs that it's used to working with are strictly hierarchical, centralized um, and intensely administered. And the authors, of, the authors of that article quote, and I thought it was quite a useful quote, they say a serious commitment to participation would require aid actors to explore how they could make their own maids of organization and operation more relevant to the networked transnational, transnational structures already present in the daily lives of refugees and displaced people, even when those structures challenge the frameworks on which aid is commonly delivered. And I thought that was quite a useful um, comment. I mean, I think what we've seen is the big international organizations are certainly appearing to take refugee-led organizations more seriously. Uh, they're more represented at the high level officials meeting that's taking place right now than they have been in the past. Canada has started to include refugee representatives in its delegation to the executive committee. And I just saw this morning that both um, USA and Germany have made a similar commitment that in future they will have refugee representation in their delegations to the executive committee. Um, and I think this is a very important trend and potentially uh, uh, potentially a very positive one. Uh, I'm just still a little bit unsure as to how these two different these two very different organizational cultures uh, can actually work together. And then the other thing that Orug may have some comments on this as she's looking at the issue. I'm wondering what's going to happen in situations where you get more than one refugee-led organization claiming to represent the same population. How do you decide between them? Do you work with all of them? How do you ensure that they're all equally or at least representative of the refugee population as a whole? So I understand why there's a great deal of enthusiasm about refugee-led organizations at the moment. I don't want to be a complete party pooper but I think some of the hard issues have yet to be put on the table. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot, um, Jeff, for, for these comments um, and also expanding on, 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 on what the um, contribution of the key contribution of uh, traffic research is and, and reflecting on what potentialities are there are in, in regard to refugee-led organizations and so on. Um, uh, and uh, what you mentioned about the, the, um, uh, the pledge of Canada and uh, Germany and other countries to, to include refugees in, in, uh, uh, in their representation onto the executive committee, uh, UNHCR um, executive committee, also reminded me of, of the very beginning of the international refugee, refugee regime well, under the League of Nations. Um, that um, refugee representation, that was part of a committee. Uh, refugees were part of a committee um, advising the High Commissioner. Uh, so they're actually steering, were part of the steering board of the um, of, of a predecessor, uh, more or less, of one of the predecessors of UNHCR. Um, I would uh, like to, to hand over to, to Megan and invite you to, to reflect what has been the key insight, the key takeaway from, from the traffic research for you. Great. Um, thank you. Um, you know, I think for me, one of the points that came out of your project and that really resonated was this idea that we just need to stop talking about durable solutions you know, in the way that we talk about tents, right? We talk about solutions as if they can be handed to somebody in the way that you might hand someone a tent or a bag of rice, um, other sort of goods that circulate in the humanitarian system. And the question of meaningful, durable solutions is just an entirely different kind of conversation, right? It's about, uh, it's about social life, it's about citizenship, uh, it's about the ways in which people belong and are continued to, treat it, to be treated as if they don't belong. So I think we we need a kind of um, shift in the way we think about this. And uh, for me, I thought your project was really great in, in showing how uh, important that is. You know, I think building on that, um, 
the cases that were explored in the FMR issue for me were really helpful in terms of uh, trying to connect the way in which the experience of protracted displacement affects how individual refugees, families, and communities um, pursue solutions of different kinds. And so how that experience of durable solutions affects the strategies um, that are used. That's something that's also been taken up by scholars like Amanda Coffey at the University of Ghana, thinking about um, how, for example, experiences of protracted displacement involvement in um, peace advocacy in refugee communities uh, in uh, exile, how that shaped um, experiences in the context of return. So that kind of work, I think, um, is really important. And, and the traffic project shows that, I think, very clearly. Um, the third uh, point that I wanted to make in terms of what the traffic project really underscored for me in thinking about these issues is that we need to talk more explicitly about class, right? Especially in thinking about mobility. Um, socioeconomic class conditions whether people can access um, secure forms of mobility as a way of managing displacement and potentially as a sort of pathway towards a more durable solution in the long term. Um, I have a lot of reservations about the ways in which um, we let uh, refugees who simply don't have the resources um, to participate in labor migration schemes and education um, migration schemes. They don't have family members in wealthy countries um, who might sponsor them. I really worry about the ways in which we just let that sort of fall to the side um, as if those people somehow don't face similarly significant challenges, um, because we know that's not the case. And so part of me thinks, you know, it's obviously important to think about how um, complementary pathways can be mobilized, but not at the expense of people who um, who can't access those opportunities. And I think that that came through um, in the really great article in the FMR issue on um, the humanitarian assistance program in Germany. Uh, this sort of idea that, yes, this is highly conditioned by class and we need to talk about that um, more frankly. And then just uh, before I wrap it up, I just wanted to pick up on the, the questions uh, and comments that Jeff raised about refugee-led organizations and, and building on a Rube's um, comments. You know, I think that this is clearly um, a really important development and I don't want to be a party pooper either. In a sense, I want to expand the party, right? I want to say we also need to be thinking about IDP-led organizations. We need to be thinking about community groups because solutions, you know, they can't be handed to a refugee by UNHCR in the way we might hand somebody a tent, but they also cannot be achieved by refugees on their own. I mean, this is about a community process. And so we need to be thinking about um, community-led organizations more generally. Um, and, you know, it's hard to say that because it makes it seem like I want to push the refugee-led organizations out of the way, which isn't at all the case. I mean, these are, you know, clearly the groups that need to be at the center of the conversation. But I feel like we shouldn't kid ourselves either. I mean, we can't get anywhere just by speaking with refugee-led organizations. We also need to be thinking about, um, you know, all sorts of other grassroots actors as well. And as Jess says, how that sort of scales up to connect with the policies um, of these big institutions, UNHCR, but also states. Um, thanks a lot, Megan. Also, um, for pointing at class and the you know the, the limited potential in terms of of, of scale, um, yeah, more mobility has for for a displaced person in terms of just being um, it's it's an option for some, but uh, clearly not for everyone, and and many will be be uh, excluded for various reasons from from these opportunities. I, I think that's that's always a little bit the challenge of. Um, from which point uh, you're starting on uh, to, to think um, if you're picturing itself, you know, uh, somebody that you uh, on a uh, yeah an, uh, an educated refugee, for example, who, who just finds barriers everywhere, and you think um, from that starting point of how could you remove these barriers to mobility that this person can uh, also achieve a career, uh, it might, uh, yeah, that leads you to, to exactly this kind of uh, education-led or uh, employment-led uh, complementary pathways, but it's, it's, it's certainly not a recipe, recipe for, um, 
for uh, the, the large majority uh, of refugees worldwide. But it might be an, uh, a recipe for opening up, um, yeah, and for example, in the European Union context, some of the, uh, yeah, stuck debates uh, about around um, Dublin uh, and and uh, uh, yeah, uh, migrate, uh, get the control, the prevention of of secondary movements, um, and over time could actually put, build up um, a momentum. And it's happening to some extent also on a, on a domestic level. Once uh, and if that's uh, that's of course on a global level also not not obvious uh, if people have the right to move uh, within uh, a certain jurisdiction. Um, I would like to, to, to invite Europe to uh, reflect on, on, on your key uh, takeaway from the uh, traffic Thank project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm having two points to raise. Uh, the first one, um, refugees are assets. Uh, there are different socioeconomic capacities, and this is something I believe we really need to be quite loud about it. So, and I, I was able to see it in, in the work, and we really need to call more and more for policies for the UN to, we need to remind them that these, hu these human beings are big assets. Assets at two levels, at the human capital level and at the social capital level. Uh, the human capital level where we really need to create the grounds for them to be integrated, just to be part and partial of societies. And, uh, and important uh, to see them as a social capital asset because of the second point I'm gonna raise, the importance of their social networks and the importance of them being able to serve themselves and the importance of them, again, coming back to the word of the localization and how it is important to create the space, to give them the space where they are able to activate the social capital. So there is the need to give them the right to exist and I always say that when I'm talking about uh, the communities, the rights of refugee communities in the Middle East under the authoritarian states that we are having, often the rights for the refugee themselves as individuals to have a decent life, to make the best of it does not exist. So when we are able to see them, when we are, call, when we are able to lobby for them to be an asset and they are able to, to be engaged in the development of the host state, this will enable them to excel. And this is on one element. And the second thing, this will enable them to create their own little communities where they're able to serve themselves. They're able to make their own decision making. Back, I'm gonna jump into the second point, really building on Jeff's comment. I fully agree with the fact that why, why, and I'm, I'm being quite loud about that, although we are working on something called refugee-led organization, the project that we are doing, in fact, in, in partnership with LEARN, uh, why, why did we decide, and on behalf of the United Nations of UNHCR, that it is refugee-led organizations, like where the jargon has come from, why couldn't we come out to the world and say, we, the UNHCR, are able to support refugee communities that are able to support one another and that are able to take off the burden from the host state and to take off the burden from the international community? Why did we decide, I'm very much, I, I cannot prove more uh, of, on what uh, Jeff has raised. Why do we really need to see them in this bureaucratized, institutionalized shape for them to be recognized by the international body? And this is one of the things that we really need to think about. In fact, I'm inviting you on the 20th of January, we are having our talk, our very first talk based on our research on refugee-led organizations, really to bring all, all these kind of elements on the word localizations, but on the word of community is how can we, and again, I'm very much answering your questions or asking the same question, how can we differentiate which body is better representing the community? Uh, when we are working with refugee-led organizations. Yet, with our critical uh, take on the word refugee-led organizations, I cannot deny the fact that it's very important for us to create the space where we are able to see the assets of the refugees 
and activate their assets at all level and, and permit them to localize their services with the, in partnership with the local and host community in order for them to have this de decent kind of living, which is again, and, and finishing with a question that was raised earlier, how do we do that? What are the challenges? There are challenges and I believe the challenges would start, I, I started my, my little presentation with the issue of the policies of the host state. It's the kind of lobbying that we as academics, we really need to push forward where when we are lobbying with the host states in order to create the space for these assets, for these humanitarian refugee assets in order to exist. You know, like again, finishing with a positive note. <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, for doing that, uh, Orb. And uh, Caroline, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. I think my, my main message or a takeaway on this, uh, I think, is that it's too naive to suppose that all these immobilizing efforts, these strict border regimes, these impediments that we create across the world to sort of reduce mobility, they are not leading to people being less mobile necessarily. People are still moving around in, in very informal ways not inside of authorities and maybe therefore also not able to fully make use of the possibilities that can come with it. Uh, so despite all these efforts to immobilize people that lots of governments take, people do move. And I think the, the example that Marcus and I give on in, in our paper on, uh, on, Eritrean, on an Eritrean refugee, we introduced Hassan who was an irregular migrant for 15 years. So he never had a formal status, but he nevertheless worked as a fisherman in Port Sudan, a charcoal maker in Port Puntland, a camel herder in Oman, a shopkeeper in Saudi Arabia, a ship cleaner in Dubai, a day laborer in Yemen. He hid in a cargo ship, which was heading to Australia, was then discovered in Mombasa. And throughout all these years, he pretended to be uh, Somali rather than Eritrean, therefore also got deported back to Somalia several times. So, Despite all these restrictions, people do move. Uh, it doesn't really hold them. It just makes them makes things more difficult and impedes them to find a durable solution. Now, to, to turn around things, I think the Congolese IDPs show is also an interesting way in which mobility can actually work if there are no border regimes, because internally displaced people, they stay within their country, so they don't face the same restrictions. And I, I think it's also in response to uh, Rebecca's question that was uh, raised in the chat. Like, of course, IDPs do have particular struggles. And there are certain issues that are largely ignored for IDPs, whereas refugees do get more attention internationally because there is not this sovereignty issue. And we can engage with refugees more easily than we can engage with IDPs. But these IDPs, they they, show, they have high levels of internal mobility. So when we conducted our traffic survey, which was for us in Congo from uh, mid-February until early March in 2020, 26% uh, of our respondents had already traveled back and forth between their community of origin and their place of refuge uh, in the same year. So that was within six to eight, eight weeks, basically. What is it good for? Uh, well, I think we show in our research that regular return trips enable people to maintain connections and hence to keep also the option of return more as a viable option, but also to mobilize resources. And these resources are then capitalized often in the place of refuge and indeed turn into an asset, as Arup as was also mentioning. And this contributes not only to the livelihoods of people themselves, but also of the for the community of refuge, which then gets access to resources that otherwise would not necessarily be available. But this is an asset that often remains quite hidden for people uh, if we have this more static perspective. So as an example, we, we interviewed a woman and I could show you the picture, maybe I should, I'm not sure whether that takes too much time. Let me share it. 
So if you see the picture, I think most people, if they approach this woman, uh, ask how she makes a living, she will be seen as this woman who does laundry, provides laundry services at the campus of the university, to students, to, to staff of the university. And this is also where she most easily relates to when she's consulted by uh, aid workers, researchers, whoever. Uh, but this is because she does this on a daily basis. But she also maintains very active connections with people in her community of origin who are then cultivating her field. And when she goes there, she goes there to provide seeds, but also to get part of the harvest. Uh, and this then is shared with her grown up children in the city. Uh, so the takeaway here is that if we are more flexible about borders, if we allow people to be mobile, they can also tap into resources in their communities of origin, for instance, and contribute to their own solution, but also contribute something to the place of refuge. Is that a durable solution? Well, I think it's a partial solution at most. If uh, if we go back to the solutions, because of course it does address some of the livelihoods concerns that people have, but if we talk about a durable solution from a more holistic perspective, we also need to address other concerns that displaced people have. So the, the psychosocial support that they need, things like, like that. Those are of course not addressed if you simply work on improving livelihoods of people, or if you enable people to improve their livelihoods themselves. So, I guess that's the, the takeaway here, that if we see how IDPs, for instance, are able to have regular returns that enable them to access livelihoods and mobilize resources, maybe we could also think about ways in which we can make border regimes more flexible in regions. So maybe Afghan refugees in, Afghanistan, in, in Pakistan could actually also do some of this if they wouldn't be impeded by losing their refugee status as soon as they cross the border. So that is, I think, the, the takeaway that I would want to share with you here. Well, thank you very much, um, Caroline, for, for, for pointing at, at, at this, well, this lesson from, from your research in, um, in the Congo. And um, yeah, and while, whilst it might be, um, um, yeah, slightly utopian to think of, of policymakers uh, and, and states buying into being more flexible in in dealing with borders and mobility and international mobility of, of displaced persons. I think there is also examples in the past where uh, in, in long uh, standing protected refugee situation where at least uh, short preparatory visits have been conducted to to yeah, raise an interest in, in return um, and prepare also um, eventually return. And if, if that's, so it's, it's not, maybe it's not a step too far in, in, in not um, binding uh, or tying to strictly such, you know, such visits uh, with, a, with a commitment to, to actually return. And um, it is also happening, uh, I think, to some extent in, in, in uh, in, uh, in, in various uh, refugee situations, especially in, uh, in, in neighboring countries. That varies, varies uh, quite a bit, uh, if not too much. And I think also in our traffic research, uh, in our preparatory traffic research, we looked at, at, at uh, the, the incidents of Somalis uh, going back to Somalia uh, from, um, even from outside the camp. So, um, but I think it's a it's it's a it's a valid um, um, point here. Um, there's still and uh, uh, the opportunity to to ask questions uh, in the uh, Q and A function. Um, we 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 reach the end of our time, but I would suggest that we stay uh, some some five more minutes um, if there is any questions. And also, I would un un invite the, the panelists just to um, to formulate in a single sentence what be, what would be your key message to the of high officials meeting uh, that is happening uh, these days in in Geneva um, or virtually 
or both. Um, what would be your key message that, that, that comes out from the policy measures that comes out from the, um, from the traffic research? Starting with you, Jeff. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I have to confess, um, over the past three or four years, I've been quite skeptical of the, uh, the, the Global Compact on Migration, CRRF, uh, and the Global Refugee Forum, and I continue to be somewhat skeptical. I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on the people attending that meeting at the moment uh, to talk up the outcome of the Global Compact on Refugees, to accentuate the positive, to um, uh, to assess the kind of the number of pledges that were made two years ago and the extent to which they've been implemented. And I think my my major message was really you know get real and see the real trajectory of refugee protection since the Global Compact on Refugees was introduced because by any standards, I think refugee protection has declined quite markedly. It's obviously difficult to measure with any precision, but anecdotally, qualitatively, I think we can see in most parts of the world, refugee protection standards have gone down. And um, that is partly uh, to do with COVID-19, but not uh, by any means entirely due to COVID-19. So my message to the people attending the meeting uh, at the moment is get real and recognize there's a major gap between the rhetoric of states and the reality of the way they behave in practice. Thank you. Thank you, Trump. Megan. Well, building on that, I would say, let's not kid ourselves that the decisions uh, happen in Geneva. I mean, the decisions happen in capitals and they happen uh, on the ground through the strategies that refugees and other community members develop for themselves and implement, often completely unaware uh, of the sort of vision of UNHCR, right? I mean, the, I think the work happens um, towards solutions and towards dealing with the difficulties of protracted situations. Um, often in a very different register and in very different places than what we assume. So I would just encourage people in Geneva to try to look at that and understand it. And I think your project um, provides some grounds for how to do that. Thank you, Megan. Um, Oro. Um, it's uh, funny, I'm very much uh, supporting of the both points raised by Megan and, and Jeff, but one of the things I've written as a, as a, as a, just a way for us to talk to the UN, uh, again, I'm very much obsessed with this idea that how can we give better space for the refugees to be, to live decently? Shall we go back to the Nansen documents uh, that were given just in the very early uh, in, in the 50s and one in order to ensure mobility for refugees, two in order to ensure more uh, respect for these refugees while they are residents in any country, and three, in order to find a very subtle solution that does not call for uh, naturalization that is very much then affecting the whole idea of the nation state, that is not calling for any perturbance of the, of the demography or of the religion of the, of, the, of the nationalities or of the race in any country. So maybe let's go back to a document that could enable these people to be well respected, to get their space, to be able to connect with their, to establish their social networks beyond uh, beyond the, the jeopardy of uh, of the whole states. Uh, it just I don't know. I, I just I wanted to think of something really out of the surreal. <laughs> so Nansen documents was one of the ideas. <laughs> just to finish with it, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any last words, Caroline? Well, I guess the, the network, the connection and mobility are very clear to, to all of us in, in traffic. But I would like to, I think, uh, pass the floor on also to Benjamin, who is leading this traffic project, but who hasn't talked so much yet, because he has just published, uh, together with the colleagues Kevin and Martin and Elwan, a uh, key insights note on the project. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's good that you also hear from them what they uh, think is most important. Okay, thanks, Caroline. But you didn't say that you have to leave now for a class. So <laughs> thanks for joining. Well, and thanks for all of your uh, your uh, your 
great great comments in the discussion. It was really really um, um, great to hear also you know what what you make out of you know what we think and and, and write and have done so much research on in the past three years. Um, so I mean just we. Um, we will post in a second um, a link to, to a document that we had prepared for this high level high level meeting um, taking place in Geneva at the moment. So where we um, have like some a summary of some key insights um, on on the discussions there, and pretty much try to align our work a little bit to the uh, major objectives um, of the global compact. So the first, I think, sort of our project can somehow contribute to the discussion. Um, about objective two of the compact to enhance refugee self-reliance. And of course, um, what our research I think clearly shows is sort of that the notion of self-reliance as such is, is a misleading one um, as such, because we are the start of it, you know, people are not alone. They are always embedded in certain social constellations, what we call figurations and, you know, the solutions available to them and the future perspective, they very much depend on these social constellations that are shaped by their families, by their kin networks, by their friends, by the local communities where they live, but at the same time also by the states and then the legal frameworks, the policies, or also financial instruments also that are made available or not. So um, self-reliance is a misleading, misleading notion. Um, Nonetheless, I think there is place for for networks and there's a place for mobility in yeah, providing better perspectives for 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 the future um, of displaced people. But it all doesn't help and it all won't work um, if people do not have a secure legal status. Um, you know, if rights are being taken away, if um, if if they experience violence um, on a, on a daily daily basis, and and this all sort of Again, just a, the basic notion of a rights-based um, approach. Um, need to you need to start with that and have to build um, build everything else uh, pretty much around that. And then I think sort of the notion of um, of complementary pathways um, I think is an important one sort of to 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 open up um, a, a space um, of of this of discussion and that goes beyond the classical um, durable. Um, durable solution that also somehow embraces um, mobility, um, not naively, um, as, as I think Megan or rightly pointed out, or Orup sort of, we shouldn't romanticize, you know, mobility of people as the solution, but it can be part of a solution and um, recognizing mobility along family networks, along with, with skills or student mobility, and also the circular mobility that Caroline and her team described in the case of Congo, sort of the translocal movements and relations between different places um, need to be recognized. And maybe the last point sort of also coming coming back to the examples um, that that Caroline um, gave about Hassan and that, um, that that lady she met in in Bukavu or so. There's not one solution, right? There's not one thing, and we we should never never forget that. You know, not to frame it as too singular in our mind, but people are combining multiple strategies, multiple um, solutions, um, and I think what our research tries to contribute is that these different yeah, strategies can be coping strategies, can be exp exp um, expressions of agency and resilience. Um, they are also connected with one another. Um, so, for instance, the onward mobility by an irregular pathway or so might provide the opportunity for others to stay um, and then continue to live or might provide opportunity for others to return. Um, so not to isolate these discussions, but to see, you know, how, yeah, how these um, solutions and ways forward in their lives um, are socially embedded. Well, thank you very much, Ben. I mean, that were um, very nice um, yeah, closing words in, in a sense. And I, I thank the panelists for um, yeah, for uh, coming here to, to the virtual space. And um, hopefully we, have, we also have once again uh, the opportunity to meet um, in person. Um, and um, the participants, thanks for the, um, yeah, the, the audience, thanks for your attention and the videos will be posted soon uh, also and um, available for, um, yeah, uh, for uh, watching it again um, very soon. And in the meantime, have a good um, yeah, afternoon uh, or uh, evening and, and um, yeah, a nice Christmas to everyone. Bye bye. Thanks everybody for joining. Thank you. A very Merry Christmas.
Thanks.